So 99 years ago, the famed German sociologist Max Weber published a revised edition of his classic work, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, and inserted into the new edition were a few uses of the word Entsauberung, a word that didn't appear in the original version. The word was meant to describe the general condition of the modern Western world. Sauber is the German word for magic, so Entsauberung is literally the unmagicking of the world, and it's usually translated disenchantment. And although the word is used sparingly by Weber, the word has taken on a life of its own. It's generally regarded as capturing something essential about life in our present condition. In his exploration of the causes of secularization in the West, philosopher Charles Taylor has written, everyone can agree that one of the big differences between us and our ancestors of 500 years ago is that they lived in an enchanted world and we do not. So our ancestors, lived in a world inhabited by gods and demons and ghosts and angels and wood sprites and saints, and the boundaries between the material and the spiritual were permeable, and the imminent world made frequent contact with the transcendent. The world was full of what Taylor calls charged objects, like saints' relics that had the power to alter reality. And today, the story goes, we live in a disenchanted world where all of that is gone, it's devoid of either divine or demonic spirits, devoid of mystery, devoid of meaning. So in Weber's view, disenchantment was the end result of a long process of rationalization in which science and capitalism were the principal drivers. Weber was himself a rationalist who confessed himself unmusical with regard to religion. But Weber didn't simply celebrate the process of rationalization and disenchantment. He thought that the technical advances of modernity came at a price, and he feared that modern people had become, as he said, sensualists without spirit, or specialists without spirit, sensualists without heart. This nullity imagines that it has attained a level of civilization never before achieved. So Weber's famous book ends with a melancholy description of the iron cage of modernity, a heartlessly efficient machine from which all enchantment had been ruthlessly eliminated for better and for worse. For an example of such a machine, I want to suggest a visit to an Amazon warehouse. And um, I'm using Amazon as my example here. Uh, Amazon might not yet be as big in Australia as it is in the U.S., but um, it's one example of a much larger phenomenon, online shopping, um, and the dynamics of rationalization are all there. Yesterday, I think, was Global Online Shopping Day, uh, Singles Day, um, as they call it in uh, China, and it was something like $2 billion in the first two minutes uh, so it, it's, a, it, it's a large phenomenon, and it, it's centered on this, uh, in some ways, the rationalization, the uh, depersonalization of the economy, and that's what I want to talk about uh, using Amazon as an example. In his wildest dreams or nightmares, Max Weber could not have foreseen the lengths to which rationalization has been taken in an Amazon fulfillment center. They are poorly paid associates who are often temporary workers with no benefits, scurry among the bins, retrieving and packing just about anything that can be imagined. A handheld device keeps track of the workers' movements. It directs them to the next item to pick. So for example, a timer starts and it says you've got 19 seconds to scan in the next item four aisles over. The device warns them if they're falling behind, it keeps track of their pick rate. Falling behind, calling in sick, and other offenses can cost a worker their job, so some associates have resorted to urinating in bottles to avoid taking bathroom breaks. In January of 2018, Amazon received patents on a wristband that can track a warehouse worker's arm movements. And responding to the negative reaction, an Amazon spokesperson presented the wristband as a liberating boon for workers the speculation about this patent is misguided. The, the idea, if implemented in the future, would improve the process for our fulfillment associates. By moving equipment to the associates' wrists, we could free up their hands from scanners and their eyes from computer screens. 
But according to James Bloodworth, who worked at an Amazon fulfillment center for six months, the real goal is not liberation of human beings, but liberation from human beings, either by turning them into robots or replacing them with robots. It was all obsessed with productivity. People were told off for taking five minutes to go to the bathroom. They started treating human beings as robots, essentially. If it proves cheaper to replace humans with machines, I assume they'll do that. That's, uh, again, James Bloodworth. So in the Amazon warehouse, Weber's description of the iron cage seems fully vindicated. But so far, I've only been telling one side of the story. The other side of the story has to do not with production, but consumption. This is where the rest of us enter the picture. For the consumer, the purchase of nearly anything online is hardly short of magical. Images of millions of products can be summoned onto a screen. The viewer can spend hours lost in a virtual environment of endless abundance, immersed in images of almost any material product you can imagine. Then you simply make a few clicks and the desired product appears on your doorstep like magic. You can see the, um, the little packages from Amazon have smiles on them as if they've been personified. If you have the money or at least the access to credit, almost anything from anywhere in the world can be summoned out of thin air to materialize abracadabra at your home. The entire production process of sourcing raw materials and manufacturing and transportation and packing and order fulfillment and delivery, all of that is invisible to the consumer as are the people that are involved in this process. So the dirt and the sweat and the blood and the tears necessary to create and move products as efficiently as possible are hidden from the consumer. All we see are images of shiny finished products and the products desire, desired can be made to simply appear often at cheap prices at our homes. So it seems like there are two sides to the modern economy, a rationalized, disenchanted one typified by heartless efficiency and an enchanted one still filled with charged objects and magic. So tonight I'm going to explore the possibility that these are two sides of the same coin. And I'll explore this idea through three sources that make for strange bedfellows, Max Weber, Karl Marx, and the Bible. So I'm first going to argue that contrary to the usual reading of him, Weber himself could not shake free of the idea that modernity was haunted by enchantment in capitalist production. I'll then examine enchantment in consumption through Marx's idea of commodity fetishism. And finally, I'll argue that the biblical concept of idolatry captures what both Weber and Marx struggled to diagnose and to cure. So the tale that Weber tells about disenchantment is complicated, but I'm going to summarize it in three steps. First, religion is the original agent of rationalization, but religion, rationalization eventually pushes religion out of the public sphere. Most uses of Weber stop there at the disenchantment of the world. But Weber also implies, thirdly, that rationalization produces a new form of enchantment, a kind of polytheism, as he says, of impersonal gods, which include the state and the market. So I'm going to start with step one. Weber regards magic as a primitive form of religion. So early cultures passed, uh, practiced magic to try to control nature, mitigate its various dangers. If we perform a certain dance, it'll rain. Magic was this worldly. It was not ethical, but transactional. Magic tried to coerce or bribe the spirits that lived in material things. And there's a sort of rationality in this quid pro quo, as Weber said. When the great salvation religions erupted in the axial age, though, they introduced a new kind of rationalization. The gods were now personal otherworldly, transcending the material world, and interactions with them took on an ethical tone. So such gods were universal rather than local gods, and this gave rise to the notion of stable and universal laws that govern nature and society. So a rational social order was complemented by an intellectual order in which the human need for coherent meaning was answered. So Weber argued people need a way to deal with senseless suffering, so salvation religions developed the myth of a savior and an ethical system in which the gods could punish the unjust and reward the righteous. 
Since so often in this life the righteous suffered and the unjust prospered, explanations were sought outside of the life of the present world. So present suffering was explained by sin committed in a former life or by one's ancestors, or an afterlife was posited to ensure that the guilty were punished and the righteous rewarded. In both cases, theodicy necessitated appeal to a world beyond the present world as we know it in order to make sense of it. So for Weber, this puts salvation religions in a state of permanent tension with the world. And that leads to step two. The more rationalized religion becomes, the more otherworldly it becomes. And the worldly spheres of politics and economics and family and sex and so on take on increasing autonomy. Worldly activity like business and war can't meet the high ethical standards of the great salvation religions. So the religious person either flees the world in mysticism or becomes a worldly ascetic like the Puritan who Weber says accepts the ultimate meaninglessness of the world, but tries to work out his salvation in the inner dialogue with God, with God while following his worldly vocation as a businessman. So Protestantism leads to capitalism. That's Weber's argument. For the Puritan, the Catholic sacraments were mere magic and attempt to manipulate God. The Reformation, says Weber, swept the world clean of such idols so that God would be all in all. But the unintended consequence of this is that eliminating God from the material world to protect the holiness of God would eventually lead to a disenchanted secular world where worldly pursuits like politics, economics, science, and so on would be autonomous and deal only in facts and not values. So I'm simplifying a long and complex story here, but basically Weber is arguing that yeah, salvation religions rationalize suffering by positing an otherworldly sphere, and this leads to a split between this world and the other world, facts and values that eventually pushes religion to the private sphere of values and leaves an autonomous, disenchanted world of fact governed by science, the state, the capitalist market. So here we are in the iron cage. Science deals only in facts. It can't produce meaning. Capitalism responds to whatever the market dictates. Values are irrelevant to it. The bureaucracy of the state seeks efficiency. It doesn't respond to the will of God, and so on. So for a lot of people, that's all they know about Weber. Disenchantment, the elimination of magic from the world. But Weber takes a third step and writes not only of the godlessness of the modern world, but the polytheism of the modern world. And what he means by this, it has to do with his conviction that human beings have this elemental need for meaning. For Weber, the split between fact and meaning, or value, is both a fact and a serious problem, because we urgently want to know what the meaning of our lives is. And so, according to Weber, science is meaningless because it gives no answer to our question, the only question important for us, what shall we do and how shall we live? So Weber rejects the idea that we can return to religion. He regards that route as suitable for people that are too weak to face up like a, like a man, he says, to um, uh, the fundamental fact that we are destined to live in a godless and profitless time. But Weber translates the question, what shall we do now and how shall we live, into this question. Which of the warring gods should we serve? Or should we serve perhaps an entirely different god, and who is he? So he thinks that polytheism is the direct consequence of rationalism. The divorce between fact and value means that the various value spheres of the world are in irreconcilable conflict with each other. There's no factual basis for choosing a value system, so you just make this irrational leap into choosing a value system, and then the various gods are kind of at war with one another. Such conflicts are decided by non-rational means, and so we just choose, the, uh, choose our values in this kind of irrational way. So Weber writes, we live as did the ancients when their world was not yet disenchanted of its gods and demons, only we live in a different sense. As Hellenic man, at times sacrificed to Aphrodite and other times to Apollo, and above all, as everybody sacrificed to the gods of his city, so do we still nowadays. 
Only the bearing of man has been disenchanted and denuded of its mystical but inwardly genuine plasticity. So it's important to note that Weber seems to observe no difference in the behavior of ancient versus modern people. So he continues, Many old gods ascend from their graves. They are disenchanted and hence take the form of impersonal forces. They strive to gain power over our lives and again they resume their eternal struggle with one another. So in Weber's view, Apollo has been replaced by impersonal gods like capitalism. And gods is not just a casual metaphor for Weber. As he says, they strive to gain power over our lives. Weber believed that the human individual has the freedom to make a decisive choice among the various gods on offer, but this choice stands out against the backdrop of the dreary constraints under which such a choice is made. The gods that can be chosen must struggle not only against each other, but against the gods that are simply given to us. And so Weber writes of Puritan, of how Puritan asceticism did its part in building the tremendous cosmos of the modern economic order. This order is now bound to the technical and economic conditions of machine production, which today determine the lives of all the individuals who are born into this mechanism, not only those directly concerned with economic acquisition, with irresistible force. Perhaps it will so determine them until the last ton of fossilized coal is burnt. And Weber continues on to say that, quote, the material goods have gained an increasing and finally an inexorable power over the lives of men as at no previous period in history. So in the 19th century, figures like Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche thought that if once you do away with God or gods, then this is going to lead to liberation for human beings. Uh, humanity would finally take the reins of its own destiny in hand and effect liberating change. Weber is much more pessimistic. He emphasized the fragmented nature of human meaning and the power and inertia of large social institutions, and so he thought liberating change would ultimately be impossible. He seems to agree with Marx and Nietzsche that there is no pre-given order, that we're just making it all up, or gods are all made up. For Weber, however, human technical prowess produces wonders, but we come to be dominated by our own creations. He calls them living machines, lebende machina, which are made in our own image and likeness. That there is, there is no true God out there to save us from ourselves. The creation of humanity are unpredictable and ungovernable, precisely because there's no inherent order to the cosmos. And so humans are controlled by our own artifacts. And so, as the monster says to Dr. Frankenstein, you are my creator, but I am your master. Obey. So the gods that are eliminated by rationalization return in a different form to rule over us. In the political, political sphere, Weber describes how nation states employed rationalized violence to protect borders, pushing religious scruples, like the pacifism of the Sermon on the Mount, for example, into the private sphere of values. You can turn the other cheek in the private sphere, but not when you've got a nation state to run. But then he says war actually out-religions religion because it creates this new form of devotion to the nation state. War makes for an unconditionally devoted and sacrificial community among the combatants and releases an active mass compassion and love for those who are in need. In general, religions can show comparable achievements only in heroic communities professing an ethic of brotherliness. Weber continues on to argue that the state does a better job than religion at giving meaning to death. And in the economic sphere, Weber describes capitalism as the height of rationalization precisely in its depersonalization of transactions. Money, says Weber, quote, is the most abstract and impersonal element that exists in human life. And he adds, for this reason, one speaks of the rule of capital and not that of capitalists. It's become depersonalized. Humans are not in charge, in other words, but are being ruled by a god of their own making. Making money is no longer a means to serve the life of people. 
It is thought of so purely as an end, of its, end in itself, Faber says, that from the point of view of the happiness of or utility to the single individual, it appears entirely transcendent, entirely transcendental and absolutely irrational. Man is dominated by the making of money, by acquisition as the ultimate purpose of his life. Economic acquisition is no longer subordinated to man as the means for the satisfaction of his material needs. And so, in a supposedly secularized world, we continue to serve gods that are every bit as transcendental and irrational, in Weber's words, as the gods of old. The holy has not disappeared, but migrated from the church to the state and the market. And note that Weber is not as interested in what people say they believe as he is in how they behave. And that's why he can simultaneously describe people as disenchanted and yet still sacrificing to gods. Okay, so so far we've been discussing the production side of modernity. Now I want to talk about consumption. So we'll go from the Amazon warehouse to the website and the happy packages that land on our doorstep. Is this a realm of disenchantment, uh, of, of rationalized materialism? The famous materialist Karl Marx did not think so. When a table is made for use, there's nothing mysterious about it. But when it becomes a commodity for exchange, Marx writes, it is changed into something transcendent. It becomes a strange thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. That's a quote from Marx. As commodities, things float free from both the material conditions of their production and from their own physical properties as use values. And so he says, in order to find an analogy, we must have recourse to the mist-enveloped regions of the religious world. In that world, the productions of the human brain appear as independent beings endowed with life and entering into relation both with one another and the human race. So it is in the world of commodities with the products of men's hands. This I call the fetishism which attaches itself to the products of labor. Now by fetishism, Marx meant more than people obsessing about material things. He meant that material things become enchanted and take on a life of their own, just as in so-called primitive cultures, fetishes were small carvings that were seen as inhabited by spirits and capable of working magic. As commodities for exchange, objects are abstracted from their use, and their value depends not on their usefulness, but on what they can be exchanged for. So for example, despite widespread hunger, a couple of years ago in Belgium, farmers dump a million gallons of milk, and the government warehouses cheese in the U.S. to support the price of dairy. So what matters is not the exchange, is the exchange value and not the use value. Commodities are dematerialized because their physical properties are swamped by their exchange value. So cheese is not primarily food for people to consume, but a commodity to be exchanged for money. And because their value is expressed relative to other commodities, Marx says, commodities establish social relations among themselves. In the market, commodities take on life and become subjects of relations with other commodities. So think the happy packages with the smiles on them. So while things are taking on life, life is drained away from actual people. Hungry people don't count in the market unless they have money. In the labor market, labor is abstract and interchangeable, and workers are regarded as labor costs, which need to be minimized. The conditions of work are hidden by commodities. All that the consumer sees in the store, or what we see on the screen, is the commodity and its price. And so it takes a real effort to uncover the people who actually made the product and delivered it, and the conditions under which they worked. The commodities are visible, but not the people, in other words. This is what Pope John Paul II talks about, is the depersonalization of the economy. So commodities take on life as life is extracted from people. This transfer of life from humans to products is captured by Eduardo Galeano's description of life under the free market military dictatorships in Latin America in the 1970s and 1980s. His quote, people were in prison so that prices could be free. As did Weber, then Marx observes that the process of production has the mastery over man instead of being controlled by him. 
So before the Industrial Revolution, people made nearly everything that they had in their homes or it was made by people they knew. Things were closely linked to their makers and to their use value. But now, if you think about your own home, we make almost nothing and buy everything. And of course, there's no point in romanticizing the poverty of the past, but it's hard to overestimate what a change this is and how we relate to the world. We used to make things and now we buy things. So when the sheer volume of things in the world took a quantum leap in the 19th century because of mass production, people needed to be taught, as one advertising manual put it in 1901, that they have wants which they did not recognize before. So people had to fall in love with commodities. Commodities, in other words, had to be more than just things to be used. They had to be enchanted. And if we look at the history of advertising, we can see how things took flight from the material world and into the realm of transcendence. So in the 19th century, advertising was largely informational. You can buy shoes at John H. Johnson's shop. By the early 20th century, advertising had become more about persuading than informing, but it was still closely related to the physical product. So as this shoe advertisement, ad, uh, as in this shoe advertisement, the ad showed a picture of the shoe and talked about the virtues of the actual physical shoe. So the objective was to convince the reader that this is a comfortable, reasonably priced, well-made shoe. The ad appeals both to the consumer's rational sense of use value, shoes should be easy to walk in, not fall apart, etc. But also to the buyer's more intangible sense of fashion, of being recognized by others as being stylish and having the good sense to buy a reputable brand and all that. By the mid 20th century, there was a shift farther away from use value and toward the more tan intangible and spiritual aspirations of the consumer for freedom, sex, prestige, recognition, other forms of transcendence. And so now you begin to get things like this ad uh, in the mid 20th century. So this is uh, 1960s. The shoe still, feel free to be appalled uh, by this. So the shoe still appears, but gone is any appeal to use value. There's no description of the shoe. Uh, there's no mention of the shoe at all. Under the influence of Freud and Pavlov and other psychologists, advertisers began to appeal not to the conscious self, but to the subconscious. So the ad doesn't lie because it doesn't make any explicit claims at all. It associates a physical commodity with non-physical aspirations, in this case towards transcendence of one's own drab life and into a realm of pathetic male fantasy where beautiful women drop at one's feet and so on. As in Pavlov's experiments with dogs, two completely different things, meat and a bell, domination and dress shoes are associated in the subconscious and the second of these things really matters little. Pavlov could have used a whistle instead of a bell. Sex can be associated with cars or shampoo or soda as well as shoes. The actual physical material products then have begun to matter less than the fantasy world that's associated with them. And as consumerism is taking flight from products, then the brand comes to take more importance than material objects. Beginning in the 1940s, corporations began exploring what brands mean to culture and people's lives. Brands increasingly became ways of marking one's identity. Corporate marketers began to encourage businesses to discover their souls. And more and more corporations used theological language to describe themselves. As one corporate manager frankly put it, quote, corporate branding is really about worldwide beliefs management. Worldwide, that might be a description of the, of the church, right? The worldwide beliefs management. By the end, by the beginning of the 21st century, though, as this ad shows, the actual product was capable of vanishing entirely. Right? Leading corporations are now more concerned with manufacturing brands than manufacturing products. Products are made in the factory, but brands are made in the mind. According to Naomi Klein, the key moment was when in 1988 Philip Morris bought not Kraft the company, but Kraft the brand for $12.6 billion. 
as Klein says of transcendent brands, liberated from the real world burdens of stores and product manufacturing, these brands are free to soar, less the dissemination or disseminators of goods or services than as collective hallucinations. What Starbucks sells is not so much coffee, as CEO Howard Schultz put it, but, quote, the romance of the coffee experience, the feeling of warmth and community people get in Starbucks stores, end quote. So as Klein writes, quote, in the new market, the product always takes a back seat to the real product, the brand. And the selling of the brand acquired an extra component that can only be described as spiritual. Branding in its truest and most advanced incarnations is about corporate transcendence. So, and, and actually empirical research backs Klein's claim. There was a series of studies published uh, in the journal Marketing Science a couple of years ago uh, called Brands, the Opiate of the Non-Religious Masses. And researchers from the US and Israel found that um, those subjects with strong traditional religious ties were less likely to be attached to brands. And so they found actual empirical evidence that brands are a kind of substitute for religion, uh, traditional religion as we usually think of it. So commodity fetishism is not just an obsession with things, it's, it's not materialism at all really, it's the opposite of materialism. It's a kind of dematerialization when use takes a backseat to exchange, commodities are inhabited by spirits and they become vehicles for a flight into the realm of transcendence. So, maybe we're not so disenchanted after all. Both Weber and Marx think that regardless of what people say they believe, modern people's behavior show the, shows them to still be in the thrall of their own creations. Enchantment still haunts the material world for Weber, production becomes a living machine and entraps us, and for Marx, products take on a life of their own that drain away life from us, even though we assume that the world is rationalized and disenchanted. Now, all of these themes appear long before Weber and Marx uh, in the Bible, and especially in the biblical critique of idolatry, so that's the last part I want to, want to say. Modern people tend to shy away from the critique of idolatry because it can lend itself to, you know, uh, intolerance and violence. You don't worship like us, so you're an idolater and so on. But the concept of idolatry seems to capture something important about the contemporary scene that I don't think can be left behind. So even though Pope Francis is renowned for his optimism and his love for all, he makes frequent recourse to the language of idolatry in his first encyclical, Lumen Fidei, for example, he says the opposite of faith is not just a lack of belief, but idolatry. And so he says, when one stops believing in God, yeah, where did it go? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, though this, yeah, I, I missed this one, but this is not to be missed. True religion brand genes, anyway. Um, but Pope Francis says, when one... Uh, when one stops believing in God, one doesn't simply stop believing. One, rather, one believes in all sorts of things. An aimless passing from one Lord to another. Those who choose not to put their trust in God must hear the din of countless idols crying out, put your trust in me, end quote. And Francis has repeatedly used the language of idolatry when describing the contemporary economic system. For example, he says, we have created new idols. The worship of the ancient golden calf has returned in a new and ruthless guise in the idolatry of money and the dictatorship of an impersonal economy lacking a truly human purpose. Um, you all recognize what that uh, golden calf is? Yeah, from Wall Street. Idolatry, as Francis uses it here, doesn't refer to the explicit worship of gods with proper names. And although the Bible does use the term idolatry in this way to refer to sacrificing to the god Baal, for example, the Bible treats idolatry principally as a matter of behavior and not belief, as in Weber and Marx. Idolatry is not primarily considered a metaphysical error, but a betrayal of loyalty to the God of Israel. For this reason, the primary biblical images for idolatry are adultery and political disloyalty. The image of adultery is exemplified by the story of Hosea, who is told to marry a prostitute to symbolize the dalliances of Israel with other gods. 
The political image is exemplified by 1 Samuel 8 when the Israelites ask for a king to reign over them. God says to Samuel, it's not you they have rejected, but me, not wishing me to reign over them anymore. They are now doing to you exactly what they have done to me since the day I brought them out of Egypt until now, deserting me and serving other gods. So idolatry is more than a metaphor here, although the king isn't explicitly worshipped as a god, putting trust in a king instead of in God to protect them is idolatry. Note, though, that God accepts the existence of kings for Israel as long as they don't replace God. Idolatry in this case, is, and really in most cases, is on a spectrum. It's not always clear when the line between using creation faithfully and idolatry has been crossed. So idolatry, in a general sense, is when people give an inordinate amount of trust or loyalty to something created rather than to God. Isaiah, for example, accuses the Israelites of idolatry for putting trust in an alliance with the Egyptian army. And so he says, Woe to those going down to Egypt for help who put their trust in horses, who rely on the quality, quantity of chariots and on the great strength of cavalrymen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel. And Isaiah links this turning away from God with the idolatrous reliance on what is, creator instead of, what is created instead of the Creator. The Egyptian is, not, is human, not divine. His horses are flesh, not spirit. And in the biblical view, anything created can be an object of idolatry. And so Paul criticizes those whose gods are their bellies and their minds are set on earthly things. And he warns against greed, which is the same thing as worshiping a false god. So the way Pope Francis speaks of idolatry of money, therefore, it's deeply biblical and illustrates the fact that for the Bible, idolatry is not merely a religious matter, it's an economic and political matter as well. The Bible really doesn't make those kinds of distinctions. Idolatry critique is not necessarily just religious intolerance. So I, Elijah's contest with the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18 is not just about religion. The rival gods represent two systems of rule and of property. The name Baal means owner. The Baalist kings have absolute power, and property was an inalienable commodity under Canaanite law. For the Israelites, by contrast, the king was subject to the monarchy of God, and property was inalienable. Each family had their share of property, and idolatry was religious, political, economic at the same time. As Timothy Gorringe comments on this passage, every generation will be confronted with its own balls, their own strange gods who grab power over them and seek to devour them. Weber's and Marx's idea that we've come, become dominated by our own creations is embedded in the biblical critique of idolatry. In 1 Samuel 8, when the people ask for a king to replace God, Samuel warns them that the king will take their sons for his armies and their daughters for servants, will confiscate their land and harvest and animals, for his own benefit, and finally, quote, you shall be his slaves, and in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. And so Jesus is drawing on a long tradition of idolatry as domination when he warns, you cannot serve both God and mammon. The Greek scripture leaves the Aramaic term mammon untranslated to personify money as a god, one that demands service. The idea in Weber and Marx that inanimate objects become alive by taking life from us is also found first in the Bible. In Isaiah 6, those who craft idols out of wood and stone become as deaf and dumb and mute as their creations, though they imagine that their creations take on life. In Isaiah 44, a man uses half a block of wood to cook his dinner and the other half to make an idol to which he bows down and pleads, save me for you are my God. And though he imagines that the idol lives, in fact, it's draining life from him. The narrator comments, all who make idols are nothing and the things they delight in do not profit. And likewise, Psalm 115 says, am I on the right? Yeah, okay. Their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths, but cannot speak, eyes, but cannot see. They have hands, but cannot feel, feet, but cannot walk. Those who make them will be like them. 
and so will all who trust in them. So again, the attribution of life to inanimate objects steals life from the humans who make them or trust in them. So the biblical concern with idolatry implies that humans are spontaneously worshiping creatures. In Exodus, the Israelites could only stand about six weeks of Moses' absence before they demanded new gods to worship. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. The story of the golden calf is a story not only of the human capacity for self-deception, but also the inherent human need to worship. This recognition allows for a sympathetic account of idolatry. So when Paul is in Athens, the book of Acts reports that he is distressed to see that the city was full of idols. But he also sees the Athenians' idolatry as evidence that they are searching for meaning and ultimately for the true God. God created everything and is therefore in all things, allowing that people, quote, would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For as Paul tells the pagans, in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. There is a sacramental view of the world here. God can be found in the beautiful things of God's own creation. So there's a kind of sympathy in the idea of idolatry that we're all worshiping creatures. It's just that our, our worship falls on all kinds of beautiful things. Weber explains the basic human need to worship in terms of the need for meaning, which leads us inevitably to make gods. Weber is pessimistic that this need can be overcome. We're stuck in the iron cage. The Amazon warehouse is our fate. Marx, on the other hand, is convinced that people will cease making gods once the revolution comes. Workers control the means of production and labor ceases to be alienated from its own products. That didn't turn out so well. The revolution came and made a new god of the communist state to whom tens of millions of lives were sacrificed. So unlike Weber and Marx, the Bible thinks there's a real God, different from all our manufactured gods. Rather than us creating gods, there's a God that created us and loves us and wants us to build a kingdom of peace and justice here on earth. In his famous Kenyan College commencement address in 2005, novelist David Foster Wallace told the graduates, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And he goes on to say that the reason you might want to worship a real God, quote, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. Worship money and you'll never have enough. Worship your body and you will always feel ugly. Worship power, you will always be afraid, and so on. It's a wonderful commencement address if you ever get a chance to read it. As Weber and Marx in the Bible intuit, however, avoiding idolatry is not as simple as making a personal choice to change one's attitude. Idolatry is embedded in whole economic and social and political systems that hold us all in their thrall. So in an unjust system, we're all idolaters, and there needs to be systemic change to free people from false worship. If there is no true God, the task is probably impossible, but as Jesus tells the disciples, for mortals it's impossible, but for God, all things are possible. Thanks for your patience.